I tend to prowl. Um, so can you all hear me if I prowl away from the microphone? Yep, or shout if you can't. I would like to pick up on a number of the points that were made in the previous discussion and also some of the points Fran has just made because there is a recurring theme in this. And the recurring theme is fresh voices. And the sustainability issue has become a stale one. And I've seen this said frequently in the last few months, not just here today. And I think that is a fundamental issue about the whole big society question. And we're looking also at channels, and we're looking at communication, and we're looking at cities. Now, I've lived in London for 40 years. I'm a compulsive city liver, and I'm also a compulsive builder. My family jokes that I'm never really happy unless there's a faint smell of damp cement around the place. So I have a real feeling that we are, that cities should not be seen as a problem. Cities are full of the people that will make a difference. The challenge, which I think came across quite loudly earlier, is how you find those people who have the story and know how to reach the people that need to hear it and then triggers a reaction that makes a difference. And when it comes to sustainability, I think most of you will agree that one of the recurring themes with young people is that they are very committed to the whole idea of sustainability. And when you, you talk to young people who are about to embark on their careers about what is important to them, they want to do something that will make a difference. And changing the, the world and making it more effective is one of the things they want to do. So why haven't we solved it? Why haven't we got all these young people who are actually delivering this? And I shall pepper this chat with some real examples. I was sitting at a group of 350 fantastic young second and third year engineering students at the Shell Center about a year ago. They were all young women, they were all studying engineering, and I did a bit about why engineering is incredible and how it changes the world. And in a chat afterwards, one of them said to me, you know, when you were saying that, it reminded me why I decided to study engineering. I said, oh, great, what are you doing now? So she said, well, I'm afraid that desire has been completely driven out of me at university. And I'm now going into financial services. There was a gasp around the table, and the young woman on my right said, where on earth are you where this has happened? And she said, Cambridge. Wow, said the young blonde woman on my right. I'm at Cardiff and I'm having a fantastic time. I'm just doing my year in industry and it's made sense of everything I'm studying. Now that was last year. So picking up the point that was made earlier, which is we have to find a way of engaging with universities and schools to get across what you can do and the difference you make is absolutely essential. Have I got a slide if I hit this? Right. Uh, I know Chris got a bit twitchy when he saw my slide arrive last night with that headline. But I can tell you the reason I called it Age, Sex and Leadership is because I've bored for England now for rather too many years on increasing the gender balance of the built environment. I can tell you a title that, like, like that clears a room in about three seconds. So you have to be a little bit more devious. So age, sex, and leadership is one way of making sure people stay in the room. Now, here's your starter for 10, folks. How many people do you recognize on this slide? Just shout out the names of people you know. Sorry? No? Paul Morell. Paul right, OK, so Bim. And at last, alleluia, a, verse, a voice for the construction industry in politics, another recurring theme. How do we make our voice heard? You must know this chap. Nick Rainsford, right. He was the only construction minister we had for more than five minutes. For seven years we had Nick Rainsford. Brilliant. Since then, it's been revolving doors. And they come out with wonderful comments about housing prices going up is a good thing. Now, you probably don't remember the chap top centre. It shows how long I've been around. He was the first man to try and make the built environment and construction work better. And his name was Banwell. 
he produced a report back in 1964. Michael Latham, John Egan, and in the middle, Andrew Wollstoneholm, who's currently delivering Crossrail. So if you struggle in a taxi through Tottenham Court Road, it's his fault. And I had the great pleasure of working with Andrew on a report we produced looking at whether things have really changed called Never Waste a Good Crisis. Now, this lot try to get together to make a difference and bring about change, and sustainability and the right people were recurring themes. Has anything changed, or are we still saying the same thing? Who recognises any of these people? Surely, Jean Venables, first woman president of the Civils. Pam Liversidge, who's just had a build, sorry? Angela Brady, great, yes. Now, there we are. We waited a hundred and something years for a woman president of the RIBA, and we got two in a row like a bus. Next to her is Ruth Reed, who is current president. We're about to get a woman president of the RICS. Lee Sharon, first woman president of the Chartered Institute of Building. Uh, Judith uh, Harrit, who is now Kenny, was Institute of Chemical Engineers last year. Isabel Pollock structurals and mechanicals. Now, suddenly in the last seven or eight years, we have a flurry of women at the top of professional institutions. So we have got a bit of a change in that suddenly the faces are different. And yes, I know we're only 12% and all that stuff, but there's been a difference. But what really interests me, if we're talking about economy and society and the built environment, is do you know what the common denominator is of these women? They all run their own business. So that creates a big question about how the industry as a whole, or the sector, operates on a great level in actually generating these people who have the drive to get to the top of their professional bodies. So that's something about the way the world works and the world of work. I ran my own business for 35 years, and I know that I couldn't have run my own business, produced three pretty good guys, my sons, still married to the same bloke, employed quite a number of people, two of whom ended up specialising in sustainable engineering. I couldn't have done all that if I hadn't been calling the shots, if I hadn't made the decision that I would finish that report at three o'clock in the morning and I didn't have to ask permission to attend a committee to make a difference. And I think what we have to realize is that the world of work is changing, and if we want a more representative group and individuals who drive change, we have to change the way we operate. And picking up, again, a theme earlier, which is how do we bring about this change? Change usually happens through committed individuals. To give another example of community, I was involved for many years on the board of Women's Education in Building, which trained more women in the construction trades from one outlet underneath Westway than the whole of the CITB. And the way the women were found was by going out into the communities, into the housing estates, and saying, you're long time unemployed, you're in the benefits track, do you want to learn to do something that makes a difference? And then they were trained. And we had to get quite political and quite devious at finding ways around solving the benefits trap. And that worked because it was driven by people who were totally dedicated and who could tell the story. So how do we find a way of telling the story? How do we get those fresh voices? And people have said sustainability has become familiar now. So how do we make it different? I mean, the reference to going back to being frugal, I now find I do things like only put the oven on if I'm cooking more than three dishes. And that's because I still remember my mother doing it. So how do we turn that into something that becomes just a natural thing to do? Not a you'll feel much better if you do it thing to do, but something that's become inbuilt. We need to find a way of recognizing that you need 
a story told convincingly to engage the people, the men and the women, who will come into your profession and into our built environment sector and continue to drive that forward. In two weeks' time, I'm going to be walking 150 kids aged 11 and 12 from Lillian Bayliss Technical College in Vauxhall along the banks of the Thames to Waterloo Bridge. This is the fourth year we've done this project. What shocked us was that very, very few of these children, young people, have walked along the river before, let alone looked at the buildings around them. We get them to Waterloo Bridge and we tell them that this is called the Ladies' Bridge because during the Second World War it was built by a workforce that was 70% women. And then we tell them how you build a bridge in the middle of a fast-flowing river and they love expansion joints for some reason, I don't know quite why. We look at the expansion joints, we explain that the piers are hollow, then we walk them back to school, it wears them out, that's one reason we do it, makes them more manageable, and we give them a quiz and then we show them a documentary and then we have a panel of people who tell them what they do in their day job in construction and they can ask any question they like. This has changed the way these kids think about the built environment and how did we get into that school? We didn't say can we come and talk to your kids about the built environment and engineering. We said we hear you're doing World War II in your national curriculum. Can we do a little project linked to World War II? And they swallowed it, and they thought they were getting a World War II history lecture. What they got was how you build a bridge, and it's now changed the way they do their curriculum. They spend the afternoon building bridges, and this year we've got design and technology. And they start talking about why you build things, the effect it has, and we talk about any issue that they ask about, including sustainability, and they're interested. So it's fresh voices promoting the important issues and making it fit them. And we need to change the face. So I'm relatively hopeful, now I've moved from the, the chaps who were on the pre previous slide to this lineup, and also looking to this audience. And they are society, it's not them and us. So we have to find a way of getting those stories that engage them that then turn into practice. And maybe they won't just put one pair of pants in the washing machine when they think about it, or cook a pizza in an oven with nothing else in it. All these tiny things that start to make a difference. And then maybe we'll have fewer students saying, I knew why I wanted to do engineering, but it was beaten out of me at university. It's my time up. I'm sure it must be. Oh, no, he said no. <laughs> so those, those are just some of the examples. So I think we need collaboration, community, but communication at all levels. And we have fantastic stories to tell. The question is to step back and realize how powerful those stories are so that we can engage others. I feel slightly as if I've been on a soapbox. I'd be very happy to answer any questions you might have but I think there are some examples of how to make a difference. And it is about time. The sustainability issue, we all know. Now let's get a little bit devious, communicative, outrageous, creative. We won't get anywhere if we play it safe. So that's why it's called age, sex, and leadership. You might not agree, but you might think about it. I will end there. Okay.